أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد uh, I am very thankful uh, to Allah سبحانه وتعالى all praise belongs to him and I send my choices peace and blessings on our beloved Prophet Muhammad the seal of the prophets Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, our and upon his uh, family uh, companions and those that follow him till the day of judgment. Uh, today uh, is a, a blessed day as it normally is for Muslims on Friday. It's a Mubarak day, uh, a day that we're told is a kind of Eid in and of itself. But also uh, this particular Friday is um, important also from the vantage point of two moments uh, in what I'll call sacred history, in our sacred history. One is the um, deliverance of Musa salam and Bani Israel from the grips of Fir'aun or the Pharaoh. Um, and the other is the occasion and tragedy of the martyrdom of the grandson of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al Hussein Radiallahu Anhu. Um, I want to connect um, this important moment in sacred history uh, to what I have to share with you today, but I'm going to inshallah tab that and tie back in towards the end. So when I want to use these Friday sessions for inshallah, at least for the ones that I'll be with you all, uh, is to actually go through some of the hikam of Ibn Atta'illah al-Askindari. Uh, as um, and I will share with you just some reflections. You know, it's not any sort of a authoritative read, but more just a space for us to reflect together on some of these wisdoms. Um, so hikam is the Arabic uh, plural for hikmah. So these are different wise sayings that this particular scholar had written down. And I'll say a word about him in a moment before going into the, the hikam itself. But um, but um, these are essentially um, here to sort of help on the path of self-development, personal development self-purification, um, making sure we have an eye on the inner workings of our psychology as we practice our deen. Um, so with that, I'd like to just shift over to just sharing a bit about him. I did this last time too, but um, and, and the last time I was here, I shared a little bit about him, but I think maybe it'll be nice just for those that may not have been present um, to have a sense, uh, a very brief kind of sketch of, of who he was. Um, so let me just bring this up so I can actually share with you. So, uh, so his full name is Sajuddin Abu Fadl Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Karim ibn, uh, ibn Atta'illah Askandari um, al Juzhami al Shadil. So he is known more simply as Ibn Atta'illah Askandari, um, which the Eskandari indicates that he was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and he was born in the middle of the 7th century after Hijri or the 13th century Miladi in the Gregorian calendar. Um, and he was from a family of renowned Maliki scholars. He himself was Maliki in terms of Mazhab. Um, one of the other things that I just mentioned a moment ago at the end of his name was Ashadili, which um, indicates the Sufi or brotherhood that he belonged to and sisterhood that he belonged to. Um, he was a master of many traditional Islamic sciences, Quranic recitation, a hadith, tafsir, uh, grammar, usul, uh, philosophy, fiqh, or jurisprudence. So these are 
you know, some of the major branches of Islamic sciences, and he was known to be a master of these. And he was also known to have, uh, you know, be an important figure, you know, within um, his practice uh, as um, his spiritual practice and as, as a part of the tariqa, the Shadili tariqa that he was a part of. So this, this book, uh, which is called the Hikam, as I was saying, is kind of a book of wise sayings, you could call it. Um, and we're just going to reflect together, and I'm going to share with you, inshallah, um, what I sort of draw from it. And feel free to, you know, I know there will be parts in the way that I kind of reflect on this first aphorism. Some of it may vibe with stories that you may have, you know, life experiences you, you may have had. And, and that's great. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for. But if you do not resonate with the way that I'm sort of reflecting on this, please feel free to, you know, draw from it uh, the good and the inspiration that feels more resonant and applicable to where you are in your journey. You know, so, you know, the way that I sort of, the direction in which I take it does not have to be the direction in which you take it. And I'm hoping we'll have a little bit of time to actually maybe talk uh, if anybody wants to share comments at the end as well. So with that being said, let me start. This is actually the first hikam, uh, the first aphorism or gem of wisdom that Ibn al shares with us. And I'll recite the Arabic and then I'll offer a translation and then I'll share the reflection. So Bismillah. Uh, he shares with us, Min alamat al-i'timadi ala al-amal. Min alamat al-i'timadi ala al-amal. نقصان الرجاء عند وجود الزلل نقصان الرجاء عند وجود الزلل So I've translated this here a little bit of my own, a little bit borrowing. One of the signs of relying on one's own actions is the loss of hope at the moment of falling short. So let me repeat that for you all couple of times so you can just kind of take it in uh, and sit with it in silence for a moment. One of the signs of relying on one's own actions is the loss of hope at the moment of falling short. And I'll say one last time, one of the signs of relying on one's own actions is the loss of hope at the moment of falling short. So let me now take you on a journey of reflection, inshallah. So what I wanna do is I wanna employ a story, an archetypal story that happens to many of us in our journey of, of connecting to Islam and as growing up uh, as, as, as a Muslim, particularly in this country, you know, perhaps this story may resonate more so. Um, but I want to use this archetypal story as a way to bring home one way of understanding this hikam. So many of us, um, you know, we reach a certain point of maturity in our lives where we wake up to a sense of moral conscience, you know, that we may have not been as attuned to, you know, in our more less conscious phases as young people. And at this point, you know, it becomes a lot harder to ignore the ingrained moral values and views we inherit from our families and from our uh, environment and upbringing. Um, and this sort of awakening to our moral conscience is often um, uh, concurrent with some moment of crisis, uh, death, or an accident, even in a car accident sometimes, something essentially that we deem significant in our life story that pushes us um, to the world of meaning, you know, to the world of meaning and finding purpose. Um, and often what happens is that once we find this sense of difficulty ignoring some of these inherited moral values, views about the world and about uh, our, our religion and our practices. And in increments, there's a tendency in many of us to turn to these inherited values, beliefs, and practices to make sense of that new world of meaning we're waking up to. 
new world of moral meaning that we're waking up to. Um, and as we turn more and more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to God, we center what's, we end up centering what's very easy to employ uh, as a measure of noticing change and transformation in ourselves, right? And so we center our outward practice often in this initial phase. And this noticing of our practice reinforces the internal world of meaning we are deepening and developing in this kind of phase of our own spiritual development. Um, however, but, here's the but, as we continue on this path, um, and often innocently and unbeknownst to us, our actions and our practice become equivalent with a newfound identity of righteousness or goodness, right? So our actions become this solidified identity of being pious or good. Now we are trying to be good. Um, and, and what this can sort of subtly entail, um, one thing it can potentially entail, one side of it is that we take pride and associate this new righteous identity uh, with our ability to, for example, pray, fast, give charity, know more. Uh, now that we know more about Islam, that also adds to this newfound righteous self. Um, so there's a kind of pride that's attached to that practice that's subtle that we're not as aware of. The other side is um, uh, often, and these can sometimes be two sides of the same coin, that we attach to this practice or newfound practice, uh, uh, it, it's also mingled in if we are people that struggle with uh, low self-esteem, which is many of us, um, that, that these practices serve as a way for us to feel, fill in that you know, lacuna of, of low self-esteem, that we have something objective to use out there in our practice to say, no, I'm worthy. I'm actually, I'm good enough. You know, I'm a good Muslim, I'm a righteous person, I'm good. So we use practice to convince ourselves or work through our self-esteem issues. Um, and sometimes, you know, that can also, the low self-esteem can also find itself reflected in the form of like a false kind of pride about um, this newfound pious identity. Um, and slowly but surely, as we're continuing in this way, uh, our ability to see ourselves in relationship to God, our ability, uh, our ability to see ourselves in relationship to God Himself, to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, becomes subtly wrapped up in our ability to see ourselves practicing, to see ourselves practicing at a certain level or in a, in certain ways, right, to a certain extent, and then naturally, what happens? is that we end up falling short, you know, or we enter a new phase in which we're not able to keep up with the same practices or finding it difficult to connect. Um, and it's almost like a, the feeling is like almost being pulled back, like a pendulum swing going back. And suddenly we're face to face with uh, a baser self than the one we pegged our initial, you know, sense of righteous identity to. And what we first entered into ends up feeling like more of a mask of righteousness than true righteousness itself. That's what it feels like. But all of this, I will sort of add as an addendum, is not necessarily abnormal. This is just a process of spiritual development. So where this hikam is coming in, um, is saying that in that moment of falling short of what we're used to doing in terms of actions, um, in that fall, we often lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We often lose, up, lose hope in God. So for example, I did all the things that a good Muslim does, but you, God, did not deliver. These are the kind of secret thoughts that enter our hearts. Where is the good life that you promised? You know, I played by the rules. I did the things I was supposed to do, but I'm not seeing that life. I'm not seeing that promise of peace. <laughs> Why don't I feel connected to you anymore? Why are you distant, Ya Allah? Why am I not able to practice what I once practiced and feel connected to those practices in the same way? 
And why can't I put out the same amount I was able to put out before, for instance? Um, and these questions too, you know, are not necessarily abnormal. They happen, you know, th this, this happens to, to many of us, if not most of us. Um, and the thing that we can ask ourselves, however, or I might even say that this aphorism is pushing us to ask ourselves instead is, was what I put out there of good, was it from me or was it from God? Is God's connection to me, is Allah's connection to me, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it fundamentally founded and pegged in my good deeds? Or did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's connection to me precede and, you know, rises above um, my good deeds, you know, and rather, in fact, that connection itself is what facilitates my good deeds. And then another way to ask it in a more direct way is, is God my God, truly? Is God the God of my heart? Or are my deeds the God of my heart? So was I relying on God when I did what I did? This is the message of the Hikam. Appreciating that those good things were coming from God, deeply appreciating that while I was doing those good things, or did I subtly rely on my deeds and my efforts to feel accomplished and assure myself that okay, indeed I was good? Or to, you know, kind of um, re recreate that kind of pious identity that I was kind of holding on to in this initial space. So this hikam then, um, and I'm going to reread it again, just so we're kind of on the on, on connecting what I'm saying back to it before exploring further. Uh, so again, one of the signs of relying on one's actions or deeds is the loss of hope at the moment of falling short, okay? So the next, the next piece of this is that this hikam then is reminding us of a couple, couple of actually fundamental principles of basic Muslim belief or aqidah that you know, align harmoniously. So I wanna briefly bring them up before, before, um, before going further. So, one of those theological principles is that, you know, uh, the unity, right, of God's acts, right? In other words, ultimately, in the ultimate absolute sense, there is only one divine actor in the cosmos. And I'm going to add to that. But to the extent, and to the extent that we have free will, right, which we do affirm, we do have free will. To the extent that we do have free will, it is subject in its entirety to the will of God, right? So there's the ayah of the Quran, um, tasha'una, and you will not will, illa an yasha Allah, except that God wills, and you will not will except that God wills, inna Allah kana aliman hakima. Indeed, God is all knowing all wise. So returning to our story with this particular theological lens that our good deeds and our ability to do good exist and occur only in relation to the supreme will of God. And in fact, it is that very relationship between our limited free will and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that link between that limited free will and the will of God that actually allows our wills to exist at all, to be at all. It is in that relationship. Outside of that relationship, there is no free will, right? So we have to learn to see that whatever we put forward of good is something that Allah is actually facilitating us. And we have to learn to see that from the eye of our hearts, right? From, from the depths of our hearts not just from our tongues or something that we affirm. And that's not an easy task, you know? It is not an easy task. This could take a lifetime. It's, you know, a very, it's something we can aspire to, you know?
but it's not certainly not an easy task. But inshallah, it's something we can deepen over time. The other theological concept um, that's tied to this discussion is the divine facilitation of our good deeds that we often call tawfiq, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you tawfiq. We often do this dua. Um, and I'm translating a tawfiq as divine facilitation of good deeds. Um, and this idea is exactly doing what this hikam is reminding us to do, which is not to envision our good deeds as our own, but rather as whatever God facilitates and enables for us. Right? So that's what he wants us to more deeply appreciate. Related to this notion of tawfiq, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit technical and having fun with some things I was reading recently. Um, so it's also helping me to repeat. Um, we find this in some of the more systematic theology manuals. Um, this idea of al-istita, which uh, is ability, right? Ability. And here we're really talking about human ability, right? So uh, some of the theologians, Muslim theologians, have divided istita into batin and zahir. And normally we would say inward and outward, but I think it's more appropriate to say a, an, a human ability that's actual or the ability itself that's actual. And, and let me be more precise. Let's just leave it at ability. So istita being ability, being divided into real or actual batin ability or apparent ability right so when a servant acts when a servant acts the servant's true or real ability to act they say is created at the moment of his or her action that is is created at the moment of his or her action by god by god um and so it's created concurrently with the action of the servant and this is what they call istita, you know, that is batin, the ability that is real and effectual, right? That has that it has a reality, right? It's and the term atofiq is applied to that ability when it's connected to a good deed. So when God creates the ability in us to do a good deed at the moment that we do it, uh, we call that tofiq or divine facilitation. And when that ability is concurrent with a bad deed, it is termed uh, khidlan, or divine abandonment. So one is divine facilitation, tawfiq, the other is divine abandonment, or khidlan. Um, and that's not to say that I'm promoting a sense that anytime we fall short, we should assume that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is abandoning us. No, sometimes our mistakes are actually a means of drawing close to him. Right, but I'm pointing to a discourse within systematic theology and ways in which you know the ulama have uh, divided these, uh, categorized some of these things and the vocabulary that they're using. Um, but I'm bringing this discussion in, not to get too heady and academic, but really you know to show that even within the academic theological works of our scholars, you know where they're really you know, gritting teeth to get down to the details of things. There, we find in it the reverberation of this idea that th this attempt to imprint within us a very particular relationship to our actions. It is a relationship that brings to the forefront the constant dependency of our wills on the will and power of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not our own, you know, not depending on our own efforts as being the thing of power and ability itself. Um, I think I have five more minutes, so I'm going to keep going, inshallah. Um, so on reflecting with you on the meanings of this hekam, another you know side of losing hope, uh, you know when our actions don't pan out the way we plan, or we're no longer to act. This is a bit more distant from the hikam, but still related. But that is that sense of uh, loss of hope that occurs when we believe 
that the power of our deeds can produce certain outcomes for us, right? Um, and so when we're looking at it from this angle, reliance on our deeds is sort of relying on their ability to create certain outcomes in the world for us. And so what this hikam is pointing us to in that case is that we have this false overconfidence or even a false belief, you know, in our efforts and our actions, which prevents us from turning over the result of whatever we do to God um, with the entirety of our being. Again, these are very difficult things, um, and I'm not suggesting that these happen overnight, you know. Um, and I'm not suggesting that I am, I, I, I embody these things. Um, but as aspirations, I think they're important. Um, you know, what kind of comes to mind is an example of what it means to put effort in but not be attached to your outcomes is, you know, it's sort of like a famous cultural image of like certain monks that build this mandala, this very intricate. And then at the end of putting in this very detail, detail oriented, hard work, beautiful design, they end up destroying their work. And um, as an exercise, basically to not attach their hearts to the outcome of their actions, right? Um, and this happens to us so often, right? That we put so much effort in a project or in certain people, relationships, and then, you know, we're let down or we personally fail in our endeavors or factors beyond our control cause us to fail. And we have this huge crisis of hope in that moment. We kind of are exhausted. We just lose the steam to build again after everything collapses, which is natural, right? Um, but I think, you know, the idea here, the reason I brought up this kind of cultural example is that um, the spirit with which we should be acting in our actions, right? So for these monks, for instance, perhaps what they're more about is centering this idea of detachment, right? But for Muslims, we are more concerned with, with um, shifting and transforming our attachments, right? Which is naturally we're attached to our actions, right? That's a natural thing to you know, have this relationship between actions and effects out there, right? That's something that is even fitri, one could argue. Um, but um, in our sort of general paradigm, you know, we're talking about shifting that initial, you know, dependency and way of looking at our actions that's coming from us and transforming it to our attachment from ourselves to God, from ourselves to God rather than just total detachment, for instance, right? Um, um, the other important thing to note about this hikam is that Ibn Atta'illah is giving us a way to measure ourselves and where we are in our spiritual journey. So if we catch ourselves, essentially, um, you know, when we fall short in our deeds, in our actions, when we're not quite up to par like we want to be, do we experience a loss of hope, you know, or a diminishing of hope, or even sometimes it's extreme, it's a complete loss of hope. We feel disconnected, right? And if this is the case, then that's telling us kind of where we are and what we need to work on. And he's telling us um, that when we feel that, um, and it's natural again to feel this in the process of spiritual development, when we feel that loss of hope or that diminishment of hope, we can diagnose ourselves and recalibrate our relationship to our actions. Um, and it's simply a sign that we need to deepen our capacity to hand ourselves over to God and to keep our inner eye on him as we do what we do, rather than us, rather than on, on ourselves. Um, the final pain point I'll quickly make, uh, inshallah, and then I will conclude. Um, I might go over slightly. I hope that's okay. The final point that I'll make in relation to this hikam uh, returns to the story that I began with. Uh, and that's that arch archetypal story of like identity um, and that identity being overdetermined by our ability to perform certain, uh, perform righteously um, at a certain level or in a certain way. Um, and I want to be clear that like it is important to have outward signposts of how our taqwa is developing, you know, and that's the part of the wisdom of fiqh or sacred law is that you have these objective guardrails to help you train yourself 
um, and kind of have a sense of where you are. Um, and it trains us also to submit you know, to something other than our own personal wills and inclinations, having these outward guardrails that 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 uh, fifth or that law. So or sacred law. So where where you know, I don't want to undermine in the process of talking about this. That from my vantage point, you know, we are blessed with an external a, a kind of external guidance or litmus test for our actions, right? And that those actions are an important part of drawing close to God in the tradition of Islam, right? Or in, 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 in Islam, they go hand in hand with Iman. And we often see that, that, you know, that except those that believe and do good deeds. And you'll find that, that duality of Iman and Amal, which is really, you know, they're not separate, you know? Uh, the actions are meant to be a reflection of, the, the Iman exists in the actions. Ideally speaking, right? Um, so that's sort of tangential, you know, to for for the purpose of clarity that it's not to say that we shouldn't be attempting to do good good in the world and we shouldn't be attempting to actually follow to the best of our abilities the dictates of sacred law. Um, but the question that I pose to you and I, and the question that I believe. Um, is I'm indirectly posing to you from this hikam is that when we fall short and our heart, house of cards sort of comes tumbling down and my hope in God is weakened or even lost for a time, where is my Islam there in that state? Do I have an Islam that can carry me through in that state or is my understanding or vision of Islam capacious enough to hold me in those states of falling short? Right. So what I'm getting at is that I think many of us sometimes struggle in navigating this in between space when we're not doing so hot, you know, where I know I'm not a, at 100, you know, maybe I'm at 50 or I'm at 20 or maybe I'm just like at one. I'm barely holding on. Can I at these lower levels still manage to find a living connection to God? And what I'm essentially advocating for is that we have to find a lived Islam that's still operational in these states where we're not able to uh, perform at our higher levels, right? Um, whether that is, you know, within the boundaries exactly of halal and haram, you know, and most of us can't always meet those anyway, right? Or whether we're falling short below that or we're not even in that frame of mind at all, <laughs> you know? But is there an Islam that can carry us through that? And I think this, this idea of maintaining a link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at both higher and lower levels of performance and being, we need to have that. And I think this hikam is saying the secret of doing this, especially in relation to our performance, when performance is the key issue or actions are the key issue, is to deepen our trust in God over and beyond our trust in our own abilities, our own performance, and the outcomes that we associate with these. Um, so I've gone five minutes over, but I feel amiss if I don't take at least two minutes to briefly mention the importance of Ashura, the tenth of Haram on this day. And I will just briefly conclude by saying that you know, it's been narrated to us that this was a day, as I was saying, that Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel were delivered from Fir'aun. And one of the fascinating things that Musa is known to have said uh, in the Quran is come to us at this precise juncture when, you know, the army of Fir'aun comes face to face, you know, or is approaching the community of Musa alayhi salam and the community begins to doubt or feel, uh, you know, naturally a state of anxiety. So in, in the Quran, it reads, فَلَمَّ تَرَى تَرَى الْجَمْعَانِ قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَى إِنَّ لَمُدْرَكُونَ When the two gr groups came face to face, the companions of Moses cried out, we're overtaken for sure. We're overtaken for sure. And Musa, alayhi salam, you know, Again, this is an aspirant, a stage of aspiring for us, right? But and Musa alayhi salam, you know, there's indications in the Quran that he's also developed, right? But at this stage, at a more developed 
stage here, he says, قَالَ كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعْيَ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ He says, absolutely not. My God, my nurture, my sustainer is certainly with me. He will guide me. He will guide me. So in this moment of angst and, you know, concern of being overtaken, there is this sense of reliance that Musa alayhi salam exemplifies um, for his community, um, this trust in God, you know, and this is also reflected in the story of um, Imam al Hussein radiallahu anhu, where he uh, takes a, um, a stand of not um, wanting to uh, participate with the power structure of his time, and, and that costs him his life. But he too, in sort of um, standing up for what he believed in, what that required of him was that sense of security because he was massacred along with his close family and companions, including children, some children. Um, and so what empowered him to do that? Part of that is that I'm putting forward this effort. You know, I'm standing up for the truth and defending my life. And I don't know what the outcome will, will be, but I rest assured that my God is with me. My God is with me, right? In the ma'ya rabbi. That's also reflected in the reality and the teaching of what Imam Hussein showed us through his example, Rabbi Allahu anhu. Um, and all of the martyrs, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them that, that, that passed on that day. Um, and um, I just want to connect this back to this idea that you know, courage is what we see exemplified in these two models in our sacred history. And, and part of what this hikam is also telling us or can teach us is to have true courage, that reliance, shifting from that reliance on one, from oneself to God and fully turning ourselves over to God is a prerequis prerequisite of developing true courage. So I say these things and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from me. If I've said anything wrong, it's certainly from me. If I've said anything good, it's certainly from Allah and from what God enabled in me. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses all of us, all of our families, especially on this blessed occasion of Ashura. Some of us may be fasting. If we're fasting, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us immensely for that. For those of us who are not able to fast on this day, engaging in any good acts on this day, um, can result in, in, in much good because the Prophet Sallallahu sought out this day to, for good. So we seek it out for the same, whether it's charity or another means of good you can find to do today. And we ask that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala enables us to see our deeds as coming from our good deeds, as being facilitated by him, as being fundamentally founded in his knowledge, uh, excuse me, in his will. Um, and um, And that we can ever deepen our ability to trust and in him and turn ourselves over to him in all of our affairs.